Welcome everyone to another evening with the Berlin Functional Programming Group. We are joined tonight from London by Jamie Willis, who is a PhD student at Imperial College London. Jamie is interested in functional programming compilers and parsers. He is specifically working on performant parser combinator libraries in Haskell, and, and that is what he is going to be talking to us about this evening. Um, particularly uh, interested in this topic personally. And I'm pleased to say that Jamie comes to us by way of my friend, Chonger Kiss, who recommended him. And of course, any friend of Chonger is a friend of mine. So uh, I'm very glad to have you, very interested in the topic, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. As usual, if you have a question for the speaker, please type your question into the chat and I will give you an opportunity to unmute and ask your question when, uh, when there's a pause and I can interrupt. So please don't just like unmute and jump in because that can be very distracting, but I will give you a chance. And please do ask questions. I think uh, one of the highlights of this meetup for me is the, the great questions that we generally get. So I hope Jamie, you get some nice questions and I will now make you the spotlit host. Cool. And the floor is yours. Right, I will share my screen and hope this works. Um... Yes, hopefully everyone can see that. We we good? Okay. Yep. Yep. Looks good. Cool. So, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for the introduction. That was great. Uh, yeah. So essentially, uh, what I want to talk about today is um, the more practical side of my work. So I, I've I've done a lot of talks and, and written papers about you know what my work actually entails, um, and not so much ever really talked about how it actually gets used. So. The outline for today is first I want to talk about just very quickly what is a parser combinator library, just in case people aren't aware. And uh, then I will introduce what Parsley is exactly, um, which uh, if, if, you, if you're unaware, which you probably aren't, um, the, uh, the point is that actually it's, it's, it's something called selective as opposed to monadic. Usually parser combinator is monadic, um, but we can't actually use that for Parsley for, for reasons that we'll explore. And um, I'm going to sort of touch on what changes when we use Parsley versus a regular one because it is it is a bit different. And then I kind of want to touch a little bit on on different uh, Parsley combinator patterns um, and how we actually write them. Um, so let's get started with what Parsley combinators are then. So uh, here's here's my very very first example, and uh, it's quite simple. It's uh, a Parsley that's reading a non-zero uh, a non-zero uh, character, which is essentially one to nine. Uh, and that's just done with the one-off combinator. So it takes a bunch of characters and it will pass any one of them. And we can extend this by um, basically just saying, uh, read a zero or read a non-zero character. And that, that constitutes a, a full digit. Now, most of the time we don't actually just want to work with characters. We're interested in, in some other semantic action, be it an AST or in this case, integers. And so what we have here is, uh, I'm now reading a non-zero digit and I'm adding that onto the front of many digits. So that many digit is going to return a list of, of characters. Uh, the non-zero will be added onto the front, and then we can use read to turn a, a list of characters in, into an integer. And that's the general principle behind um, most of the stuff we do with, with the combinators. Um, and as another example of this, an identifier is going to be something that is a, starts with an alphabetical character, but then can continue with zero or more um, alphanumeric characters. So that's sort of the, the basics. Um, and they sort of, they have these primitive operations. So at, at its core, a parser combinator library needs satisfy uh, or an equivalent, which basically says, uh, you give me a function that, that returns true or false given a character. If the function returns true, I'll read the character. And if the function returns false, I'll fail. Um, then you also have try, look ahead and not follow by. Try is used for backtracking. Look ahead is it's positive, look ahead, not followed by is negative, look ahead. Those aren't sort of important for this talk, but I've put them here to illustrate they, they do exist. Um, and so for example, uh, with satisfy, we can build item that reads any character at all. And the, the predicate for that is just return true, right? no matter what, true. And reading a specific character means uh, basically checking is the character equal to that specific character. Uh, as another example as well, EOF, the, um, the parser that ensures that there's no more input is implemented by saying, there is not another character that follows, which I think is quite neat. Um, 
but most of the time we don't just work with these little primitives. We have a whole bunch of other operators built on top. Uh, and there's the, the classic, you know, functor, applicative, and alternative hierarchy. No, I haven't put monad in there because um, we don't we don't play with monads in this in this library. Um, and you know, basically they're responsible for either in in, a, in alternative choice, uh, basically picking options, or in applicative and functor is sort of you know building the data types and semantic actions and, and combining them in the right way. So app can be used to combine uh, different parsers results together. Uh, as can fmap, pure is, is sort of the, the parser that doesn't do anything, but does return a result. Um, and the, the whole idea of the combinator style is that you use regular functions in Haskell or Scala or OCaml or whatever language you're working in to build parsers. It's not just writing a grammar. Um, and this is sort of uh, my, my favorite example of this in action. So uh, sequence, which is, is a standard Haskell function, uh, it is very useful for parsers as well. And it's basically saying you have a list of parsers and you want to execute them one after another and combine the results up into a list. And um, you can take this a bit further by starting with a list of pure values. And if you have a function that can turn each of them into a parser, then you can make a whole bunch of parsers one after another. And my favorite application of this is actually the string combinator. So what, what strings meant to do is you give it a string and um, it will pass that string exactly. And the idea is you turn each character in the string into a parser recognizing that specific character, and then you sequence them all one after another until, until you've ended up with the string. Uh, another example is the one-off that we've seen before. Uh, we can build that by mapping character to get, again, a list of, of parsers that read specific characters and then folding them up with, with alternation. So we can just say, try the first one, then the second, then the third, then the fourth, and so on. So if we uh, sort of take stock here and go back to our original examples, um, we can sort of see them in a bit of a new light. So the, the digit there is actually, we could have written one of naught to nine, and it would have been no different because uh, behind the scenes, it is just going to be a long chain of ors anyway. Um, and so it's quite nice to sort of appreciate how, uh, how everything is sort of built up out of these, these smaller chunks. So that's sort of the very, very basics of, of combinators. And you, know, you can spend several hours talking about various different things you can do with combinators, but that should give you a general idea. So what is, what is Parsley? Where does that fit in? So uh, here's what Parsec is like, in, in my opinion. So it's got reasonable performance. Um, its error messages are okay. It looks quite a lot like a grammar if you compare it to you know, a handwritten parser, but compared to a grammar itself, it is, it's a little less similar than you might like. Um, Digging wise, they can be quite tricky to debug. And analysis is sort of a no-go too, because um, Parsec actually does something. When you, when you write the combinators, they do things, and there's nothing we can sort of inspect or work with. Parsley, on the other hand, uh, sort of iterates on this a little. So the, the performance is really good um, for reasons that we'll, we'll cover later on in the talk. Um, it doesn't have error messages, but don't worry, I'll, I'll get there. Um, when I've got error messages, they'll be around. It looks just as much like a grammar as, as Parsec does. Um, you know, any one of the, of the combinator family is going to have that sort of same property. And Parsley does have a couple of functionalities to ease with debugging, um, but analysis is actually somewhere where it shines. So uh, Parsley is implemented as an AST. So instead of doing things, it's actually just a tree that does nothing. So we can do all sorts of analysis and optimization and all sorts of fun stuff. So how does Parsley do that? Well, it uses metaprogramming. And um, no, that spawns off its whole other talk about what metaprogramming is and how it's used to actually build these things up. Um, but all we need to know for the moment is that metaprogramming is where code is a first class value. So we build programs that build code. It's sort of like being a compiler in some sense. Um, and the pipeline works like this. And, and it's sort of, it's not really important to understand these, but some practical implications for us as people that are using Parsley do come out of this pipeline. So this first one is this combinator tree. So I mentioned we have this abstract syntax tree that represents parsers. And the problem is recursion. So uh, I've already said, you know, we iterate over, we compile it, we analyze it. So infinite parsers are a big problem. So when we define many conventionally, and normally it's defined with some, but for simplicity here, we'll, we'll do it in just terms of itself. This 
isn't a finite parser. So this is an infinitely big tree of these combinators. And this, on the other hand, is a finite tree that uh, infinitely cycles. You can walk down the Go, uh, the Go object forever, but uh, you will get back to Go eventually. And that's an important distinction between the two. Every time we call many here, we get a new parser being made over and over and over again. But when we have Go, we'll hit the same thing. And um, that's important because Parsley can pick that up and can basically tie the knot and work out where the tree stops. Um, so it's important basically for our, for our sake, we, if we need to write recursive parsers, we have to write them with let form. Um, and that obviously means that if you have an argument that changes as you go down the recursion, you kind of lose that. And um, I'll come back to that. So I'll, I'll talk about how to recover that later on. Um, the next sort of stage is the optimization and analysis. And the sort of key takeaway from that is that Parsi does some really cool things to do with optimization. So at the top there, you've got this esoteric uh, parser that F maps Fs onto Ps and Gs onto Qs. And what Parsi can do is it can factor both of those functions out and uh, do them all in one place. So it can take the X and the Y that come out of P and Q and combine them in the same way, but it is one less operation. Um, and a practical uh, implication of that is actually when you do a string combinator, Parsi can rip out the building of the string all up front and basically read a character, read another, and then, um, and then just return the string that we wanted, which is quite neat. And what I found is that the more naive you write your parsers, the better they get optimized um, and uh, the better job Parsley can do with them. Um, and so that's the moral. Let Parsley do your optimization for you. Write things naively, see what happens. Um, and now we cut all the way to the end. And I don't expect anyone to understand what on earth is going on here, but it's to sort of illustrate that when we have a parser that looks like natural on the left, um, this is what we might see. If we were to you know, break open the core and have a look at the, the compiled file, this is the sort of thing we'd see, nothing, nothing like the original. And that sort of gives us our first taste of template Haskell as well at the bottom, um, where we can see you know, this double dollar. So we run parsers by using double dollar notation, and that comes direct from template Haskell. So we're starting to see the influences. Um, and this all happens at compile time. So uh, like I said, if you look over the file, you'll see the thing on the right, not the thing on the left, uh, which means that you know, no matter how much work I do, it's just increasing your compile time. Um, and we've all got time to wait. We can just get coffee and stuff like that, but our users don't want to wait for their parsers. Um, and so a real key thing is, if you've, if you've heard of template Haskell, actually Parsley uses typed template Haskell, and it's a bit more principled. So the, the difference is that um, in template Haskell, you can build anything, any random thing, and you hope it type checks, but you'll find out later after you've run it. Type template Haskell basically gives types to uh, code, and you have to use quasi quotes. And at compile time, you get a bit more guarantee that, that it actually works properly. Uh, it can still go wrong, but it's, it's sort of a nice guarantee. So it's a bit more principled, quasi quotes only. And we'll see what that means because we'll have to use the quasi quotes. Um, so before I do go there, I want to touch on Monad's selectives. I think this is probably a good chance uh, for questions if there are any at the moment. Um, otherwise, I will move on. I don't see any in chat quite yet. OK, cool. Um, so I will continue then. So before we get on to you know, the actual seeing how it's used, I do want to cover what the why, why monads don't work and why selectives are here. Um, so, you know, monads, hopefully we all know what they are. They're, they're ubiquitous. Uh, they're applicatives with a bind tacked on the end. And bind allows you to basically inspect a value and build more computation from it. Um, so here's some, some nice examples. So we can build satisfy out of item. We could go the other way around. We say read any character at all, take its result out, which is the C. And then if F of C is true, we can just return C, otherwise we'll fail. Um, and my other example here is, is identifies. So before we just said alphabetical followed by alphanumeric, but we can go further and say, actually, you know, if we have this is keyword function, we can ensure that any identifiers we read aren't keywords, which um, practically is quite useful. So you, know, you don't want to have your users naming variables if and while 
and the parser getting confused because they are valid uh, in terms of the in terms of this rule here. Um, and this is sort of a little pattern. So we can we can see it's sort of a similar shape. So I can sort of factor that out. And we can see it on its own. Uh, and the pattern is called filter. That's what this angle question mark angle is uh, is pronounced like. And it basically says we're going to execute something, check whether uh, a function holds true on its result, and then if it does, we can carry on. Otherwise, we'll fail. And um, just to sort of nail that in, let's take a look at the things before with this with this factoring out complete. So satisfies now item filtered by some function f. And identifier is the alphabetical sequence filtered by it not being a keyword. So that's in general uh, what we're looking at here. Um, and I think this is this is quite a practical, one of the practical uses of bind that I see in the wild. Um, and, and I do like this sort of bit more abstract way of thinking about it. And you know, at this point, you'd be like, "Wow, they seem amazing! Look at all the cool things they can do. Uh, what on earth are selectives? Why can't we just use monads like normal people?" And uh, the answer is subtle, but it involves compile time, because this is a big problem. Um, at compile time, I need to know everything, and bind doesn't let me know everything. We'll see what selectives are, and then we'll see how they compare and why uh, why this is the case. So selectives are, if you haven't seen them, they're quite new in the world. They've been around for a couple of years. Um, they're one of these two things. Uh, I, I choose to pick branch. I think it's a bit more intuitive. Uh, and it basically says that you have a parser. The parser returns either an A or a B. Um, you don't know which yet, but you do have two possibilities you can use. So if, if we get an A, we'll want to use this first choice. And if we get B, we want to use the second choice. Regardless, they both make Cs. So we'll get an F of C out at the, at the other end. Um, and so the, the crucial thing with selectives that make it different from applicatives is that uh, you only have to execute one of those two things, not both. Um, and so let's see what that, what that means. So if we have our old filter from before, um, we have this gray box. And the gray box is uh, what's inside the function. And we're not allowed to look at gray boxes because as a user, we can't inspect functions generally, only GHC can. Um, now the problem is there's this orange structure, which is the, the syntax of parsers inside the box. And that means that at compile time, I, as, uh, as the parser compiler, have no clue what happens. I, I do not understand what happens after the MX at all. That's a big problem. Can't generate code for something I don't understand. Um, if we switch it around to use the selectives, and I won't explain how this works, but all you need to observe is that all of the passing syntax has exited my gray box. So now at compile time, what I'm, what I'm sort of left with is uh, information about how a choice is made. So I know that um, I don't know how a branch is taken. I don't know under what conditions uh, the left branch or the right branch is taken. What I do know is, the outcomes of both of those branches. So with select, one of them is going to be the identity function. Um, and the other one here is chosen to be empty. So if we get a left, we use empty and fail. Otherwise, we use the identity function to recover x. So again, we don't know how this is going to operate, but we do know all of the possible outcomes at compile time. So we can generate the parser and leave the choice to runtime. That's the important distinction. And uh, that's, that's it, the world is fixed. Everything compiles, everything will run, everything's okay again. Um, and so now you can ask me the same question. Well, they, they seem great, what can't they do? And uh, the answer is they can't implement join. Um, and that's sort of a subtle point. And I, I think I'll touch on that a bit later uh, in brief why they can't do that. They also can't persist results, which is also something we can do with monads. We can use a result that we've already seen before again and again and again, and, and you just can't do that here. Um, and you might ask, well, is there a way of getting that back? Seems like this would be useful stuff. I mean, sometimes it is. Uh, it's, it's not always useful to have this. Um, but yeah, and I will cover that at the end. That's my, my last section. So um, now we're on to using Parsley. This is the, the meaty bit. If there are any questions now, this is another good good time to, to pose them. I can give people a second to type any questions if they have them. Just a question about the selective. This is something that was introduced 
specifically to uh, work with parsers? Or I mean, it looks like some kind of uh, type level, like branching at the type level. It's it's uh, yeah. So it, it's a more general construct. So it was basically introduced um, in 2018 as uh, kind of between applicatives and monads. Um, they're a bit funny because you can implement them applicatively or monadically, and they have different uh, different results. This is the monadic version. Um, they're basically yeah. So if you think of uh, if you think of applicatives as being function application uh, abstracted, then a, uh, selectives are basically case statements abstracted. Um, yeah, this is what it, this is what it looked like. Yeah. Um, how how do you how would you explain the distinction between this selective and alternative? Uh, so alternative allows you to to backtrack and take branches. Um, you don't get to take you you don't base your decisions based on the results of the parsers. So the or is input driven, right? Mm -hmm. um, with the selective operations, you make a choice. You've, you've read something successfully, and now you can say, right, uh, depending on what I've read uh, and the structure that came back, I want to take one of two branches. Um, so, you know, a good example uh, might be if you saw, it's really hard to think of practical examples off the top of your head, um, but you might basically want to say, if the last thing I read uh, was a seven, then I want to go and read something else. Otherwise, I want to go down another branch. And you can, in a lot of times, uh, use OR to implement those, but it, not in general. So filter, for instance, you can't implement that with, with OR, so it just doesn't work. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of the gist. Um, selectors are really useful for static analysis, essentially, because you can, you can find all of the possible branches and paths that you can get through. Okay, I'm guessing the point is you're you're giving up the power, or you're giving up some kind of power from monads in order to create some useful constraint. Yeah, exactly. So you've lost the ability to generate new structure, which is what Bind gives you. Um, but what you've gained is the ability to analyze all of the possible outcomes, because um, you know statically what possible branches could happen. You know all of the outcomes of the selectives. Just ah, okay, 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 okay. This makes sense. Yes, okay. You need this like certainty. Yeah, exactly. And you need that certainty because we're going to compile them at compile time. Okay. Somebody in the chat said they're going to ask the same question, so uh, I'm not. I'm not wasting your time. Also, we have a comment from Ben who says this was a big part of the argument for arrows over monads, and has a similar feel to him. Oh, maybe you could comment on that, says Ben. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear a comment on that because uh, I've heard this said before. Oh, he wants you to comment on it. Oh, he wants me to comment. <laughs> uh, again, I've heard, so I was introduced a couple of years ago to the idea that, that people did arrowized parsing. Um, that sounded wonderful, but I'd never actually explored it myself. Um, I think the general consensus is that, um, I remember having a discussion about this before, and I can't remember whether we came to the conclusion that arrows still allow you to generate dynamic structure. If they do, um, then they, they have the same problems. Um, otherwise, you know, they, they might solve this problem. And I can't remember the conclusion we came to, um, which, you know, at this point, I really should. Uh, but it, it's possible. I think if, if you can do everything you can do with monads, I think there's, there's something fishy there. So if they're, if they're less powerful than monads, then, you know, maybe they're equivalent to the selective story. Maybe they can do slightly more, slightly less. Um, ben, ben, did you want to unmute and uh, respond? Hi. No more. Yeah, I mean, so there's this there's this sequence of applicative, then arrows, then monads, and I think what happened a lot with people building arrow parsers was it turned out that applicatives were generally enough for almost everything hmm. that that people wanted to do because um, arrows are really awkward to work with, and I think what you're doing is exploring that in between space between monads and applicatives in a, a different hopefully more useful way yeah i think that's that's sort of the sense i get i mean for me really the, the reason why it's okay to get rid of monads is that most of the time yeah you just don't need them um it's only when you want to get context sensitive things that you need monads and filter is like it's sort of brushing on the edge of context sensitivity it's like a useful form that doesn't really do much. And that's most of the story with selectives is they're mostly useful things that don't really do much. Um, but I think selectives aren't too difficult to work with. Um, uh, but I haven't played around much with arrows. I think 
when I back when I was you know younger and looking at these things, they they did intimidate me a bit. So I think there's an argument to be made there about you know are they are they usable in this in this context? But I really should look into it more. Um, so thanks for that. Um, okay, is there anything else, or should we move on? Um, no, I think we can move on. Thank you. Okay, cool. So uh, yeah, now is is time to actually look at what happens when we try and use parse these. So we know now that there are no known ads. Uh, we know that there's template Haskell involved. It's now time to see you know, how does that affect things. Um, so like I said, we use type template Haskell. What does this mean for us? So here's our combinators, all of our favorite friends from before, and uh, they're all going to change, and they're all going to get uh, either a WQ or a code. And uh, WQ is, is uh, a general structure, but it exists specifically in Parsley as well, uh, that basically pairs up a value with the Haskell represent uh, the Haskell AST representation of that same value, um, and so that's needed. Uh, basically, the optimizer might want the values. The code generator needs the code, uh, and so they they both get paired up together. And when we run a parser, um, instead of just using the function, we have to take the compiled. Well, this is the representation of a Haskell function and splice it in. And the act of splicing basically injects the generated code into a hole. Um, and it's worth noting actually that these, this parser has to be defined in another file um, because template Haskell is a bit awkward. It needs to compile itself, load itself in, and then it can splice the code that it's generated uh, through. Um, and it's the act of splicing that generates these optimized chunks of code that, that we saw previously. Um, that we don't really need to know what's going on. Um, so the question is, what happens? What does what does WQ do? Um, and it is interesting to note we've lost applicatives. We've lost all of the of the type classes um, because WQ sort of breaks all of the types. Uh, you know that's a um, it's a shame, but it doesn't really stop us in any way. It just means that the Prelude conflicts with Parsley all over the place. So. Um, What's the best way of dealing with WQs using the lift plugin? Um, so basically, the way the lift plugin works is uh, it can generate these WQ values for you by taking the value, pass it, and giving it the code. Uh, it's a parser plugin, I think, or a type checker plugin, one or the other. Um, Parsley has its own version to correspond to the code function. Usually, it's just the pure function. So that's all. That, this is all that has to change. We we go from this. And we add a dependency on the lift plugin. We add code to all of the little functions, and we're done. Um, so it's not it's not so difficult. Uh, but the lift plugin does go wrong every now and then. Um, I say every now and then, quite frequently. So uh, let's figure out why that happens and what we can do about it. And here's an example of where it all goes very very wrong. So if I try and take uh, the code of equals equals a, the lift plugin will reject this. And it could be enhanced. We could we could fix that, and I'm I'm kind of tempted to do that at some point. Um, so this this is broken. So what can we do? Well, we could cave and write our WQ ourselves. Um, and so this what this is what the the code should generate, right? It's a it's WQ with equals a on one side, and a quasi quoted equals a on the other. Now, um, people that are familiar with template Haskell might know that you use uh, square bracket bar for a quote. Uh, there is another bar here because the other bar represents typed template Haskell quotes. Um, so that's what we need here. And so this this would work fine, but you know we don't want to write this. This is an absolute mess. Um, if we had to write this for every combinator, we'd be driven mad pretty quickly. Um, you know the the sledgehammer approach to fixing this is to define this as a function is a in another file because again we can't use. Um, we can't quote this code unless it's been defined in another compilation. It, it does get quite annoying um, when that has to happen, but you know it's the price we pay for performance. So this would work, um, but there is uh, another solution. Uh, what we can do is we can just pull in another plugin. So uh, the Idioms plugin basically uh, it's a more again it's a more general plugin which I've corrupted and twisted um, to work with Parsley. That's basically meant to be um, idioms notation. So that's basically applicatives. So you can think of this as like uh, equals f mapped onto pure a, right? That's what this kind of morally translates to. Um, because it turns out that wq is an applicative. 
um, where code is the pure and um, the fmap I call uh, map. And so this is uh, this is how that translates. Essentially, this is this this sugary syntax with um, parentheses and square brackets turns into essentially code of equals quapped, um, quapped because it's working on queues, uh, quapped onto the code of A. Uh, again, it's given a different shape because I don't want it to conflict with Parsley's own app. Uh, so everything has to be different. Um, but that's that's roughly you know how this how this works out. Um, so that's that's one way we can fix this problem. And uh, again, this is another example where the lift plugin wouldn't work, and we could do it manually. That's to, to compose two functions f and g. Um, and again, the idioms plugin can be used here. We can basically say code of f dot code of g. This will get translated into code of dot, quapped onto code of f, quapped onto code of g. Alternatively, we can use our model from earlier, which was um, don't prematurely optimize, let Parsley do it. So if we wrote this um, reversing the optimization of the functor law and basically say fmap f onto fmap g onto p, uh, Parsley will just convert it to the second line. It'll do that for us without us having to negotiate with the, with the idioms plugin at all, which I quite like. So I would tend to use this form um, just to avoid, you know, unnecessary plugin dependencies. But the plugins are going to be there regardless. So, you know, it's up to you. Um, so that's that. So, as I said, it'll get translated. And that's really all there is um, to the difference between using it. It's just a case of knowing where to put the codes or the idioms plugin, um, or just when to cave and write it yourself. Uh, one of those valid methodologies. Uh, but other than that, you know, everything else really remains the same. So we've seen all of the differences. Um, and so the next part is going to be talking about some of the patterns. Um, in particular, how do you get rid of bind? Because that's sort of hanging around um, in the darkness. And how we can get back the power that we lost when we, when we sort of threw bind away and adopted selectives. Um, so again, this is a good place to stop for any, any questions that, that we might have um, before the, the final stretch. Nothing in chat right now. I'm just giving people a moment. Yeah. If you, if you have a question and you don't feel like typing it out, you can just say you have a question. It could be that you're explaining everything with perfect clarity. Well, you know, we can only hope. But... I, I, I enjoyed the discussion of uh, quapping. Yeah, that was a great, I love that name. Um, you know, it just works so nicely. Yeah, and the uh, operator is cute. Yeah, yeah, just turn everything inside out. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <make> the, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. uh, that's what that's what you have to do when you when you have to hide everything in the prelude. Um, did you say that the uh, the idiom um, plugin? This is something you developed. No, so it's something um, that previously existed and then I corrupted. So it used to work with Pure and App, um, mm -hmm. and so obviously the change I made was to twist it so that it used code and quap instead. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I do probably need to republish it or package it up as the parsley specific version. Um, but it is a plugin that does it does already exist. Um, okay, yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was wondering about that part. Okay, so you, you didn't like make upstream changes? No, 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 no. Okay. All impose on, the, on all of the poor, poor innocent people using the, the idioms bracket plugin. Hacking. Yeah, yeah. You're you're hacking your parsley. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> gotta gotta get all the hacks in. So again, the lift plugin um, it used to work with pure, and I forced it to work with code instead. Um, looking, I'm looking forward to the follow up package garnish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The parsley garnish, perfect. Yeah, that's where I'm going to put all my plugins. Perfect. You can, yeah. you, please, <laughs> please take that. Uh, I'm 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 out of puns, and I uh, I can't stall any longer. No more questions. So let's uh, move on then. Okay, cool. So final act, patterns. So I've mentioned um, big, big issue. Uh, if you if you were to dig into the original Parsec source code, it has changed. Different libraries have sort of evolved a bit. Um, bind is all over the place. And uh, that's frustrating as someone who is now um, banned uh, in every capacity from ever using bind again. So what you have to learn um, very quickly when you're in my position is how to stop using bind. 
Um, and so I'm going to work with two practical examples to sort of give a sense of how they of how they work and and how they are in some sense patterns. Um, and uh, these are the the very um, very very useful chain combinators. And if you don't know what they do, they basically take a parser that returns A's, one that returns operators, and it basically passes right associative applications off those operators. So you know it's going to read an X, then an op, then an X, then an op, then an X, then an op, and combine them right associatively because it's the chain R1. If it's the L1, it would all happen to the left. Um, and this is the definition as it stands. Uh, I've taken away the do notation for, for simplicity uh, in Parsec. And it is thoroughly useless for us because um, there are four, three binds, three whole binds, and all of them are not needed. So first, uh, first attempt at, at dealing with this, this problem is uh, when you see something like p bind rest, uh, most of the time, if you can turn rest into a pass that returns a function, you can use uh, the reverse app. So I'll do that um, here. And uh, now everything doesn't compile and breaks. So now we've got to fix the rest. So now basically the result of rest is a function and it will be applied to the p. That's the very, very first uh, thing in the, in the associative chain. So this x is now problematic and we need to get rid of this. But we can notice that in the second branch, we will return x directly. So if we turn that into function form, that's going to be the identity function. No, no problem there. And now we've got this last x. Um, and this one, this one's fine, right? We can just do some Haskell, Haskell magic and uh, flip it round. So we'll have flip of f, y, x. And then, yeah, just get rid of the x um, by, by eta reduction. The argument's gone. Um, hey, presto, it all compiles again. Um, but we're not done yet, right? Because we've got this bind here and this bind here, and they're going to they're gonna get in the way. Now, the translation is quite simple. This is um, basically the poster boy of applicative translations, right? So you have this op, you get an f out, you do something else, you get y out, and then uh, you basically f map flip onto these things here. So we're, we're returning blah, blah. Um, and that just means you f map flip on op and then app it to chain r1 p op, which looks like this. And honestly, I think this is just a nicer form. I think the applicative notation makes it a bit easier to reason about. And so for completeness, how does this look in Parsley? Well, not much changes, um, but we do need to add our codes like so. And again, I can't have this sort of primitive recursion lying around. So I've made a go, go points back to itself. Uh, this is now a cyclic parser and the world is okay. So that's chain R1, that's the easy one. Um, there's no prizes for guessing the next example. Uh, it's chain L1. Um, another very, very useful one, arguably more useful than the chain R1. Um, and again, here we can see that there are three binds that we need to eliminate. And I'm going to apply the same strategy to the top. So uh, off it goes, becomes a function, and now for the hard part. So again, the, the pure x, that's, that's, that's easy to get rid of. We just pop an identity function in there. This bit, on the other hand, isn't so easy because we're applying it to a recursive call to rest. So we're kind of we're kind of stuffed at this point, um, and so we can think, okay, in this world, rest returns a function, so uh, we can call that g. So let's let's imagine we're f mapping something onto this to to do some work, and we're gonna get a g out, um, and and we're gonna get an x that needs to be passed in, right? So this is like you, you can think of this like when you when you want to write fold. L in terms of fold R, you, you introduce the identity function, hey, there it is, and uh, you, you start pushing things down as, as functions instead of, instead of normal arguments. So we rip that out, right? The G comes from the rest, and we're building this new function as the result of us. So we need our X, uh, which previously came from here. Now it, now it just materializes, and it's going to come from here eventually. And uh, we put them together in the same way. So we're saying, carry on with this as the new accumulator. Um, but we still got those binds. So it compiles again. We need to get rid of the binds. Um, and so what I'm going to notice here is that I can just do some fiddling. Um, so if we can if we can turn this into a parser in its own right, we can we can move the rest outside. Um, and that's sort of a, a sort of small nuance, right? So you can say, you know, return a parser at the end of the binds, 
and then app that onto REST. So the REST has now exited the bars. That's good, that's where I want it. Um, and if we do that, uh, we can basically see it's, it's starting to look similar to, again, this pattern of something, something, pure, some applications, but it's not quite in the right shape. Um, so I'm just gonna start fiddling. I'm gonna do the general Haskell fiddling things. So I'm gonna flip F round, uh, so the X is on the outside. I'll shove a compose in here, and then we can get rid of the X. Uh, and then, you know, we can flip the compose, turn it into its own blob, and we've gotten rid of the G as well. So point three, um, that's all I did, just translated it into point three notation. So, you know, here we can see, you know, there's a flip, there's the F, the Y, so this is all in the right order. Um, we kind of want to get rid of this. So we can break this out um, using that functor law. We've seen a similar example before. Um, so we factor that out. And actually, if there's a, an F map inside a bind, outside a bind, it doesn't actually matter. So I can just hoist um, and be left with this, this simpler expression. And now clearly we've already seen this, right? This is the, the F map flip onto op, apt onto P. So that's that. We've, we've crushed that down just enough um, to make it work. And again, how does it change? Um, well, I've got some idioms brackets here to apply flip to dot. I've popped a code in for flip and I've popped a code in for identity. Uh, this time rest was actually already in the right form. It doesn't have any arguments. So uh, no extra addition of anything new. Um, so that's really the hard bit. So we've, we've again, we've gotten rid of these binds. Um, and so now Parsley is capable of compiling it. So that's a bit of a, a, a sort of trickier example, but nonetheless, uh, it's the sort of style that you're working with. It's always fiddling, flipping, uh, ripping stuff out, moving stuff around. It's helpful to know what the laws are and how, why these transformations work. So um, what now? So we know that, that binds that use if then else, essentially they're the ones that we use selectives for. So whenever we have this if statements or cases, Selectives probably handle them. Um, but, you know, earlier on I said, well, ooh, we've lost the ability to do uh, recursion where the argument changes. And um, I said, I, I said, I'd come back to it. Now's the time. Now. And it's registers. So this is, this is, something, this is something legitimately new. Um, personally, I haven't seen anywhere else that uses them um, like this. Uh, other than my own other parsley. And um, essentially they're gonna encapsulate every other behavior that we've lost from bind. So here's the interface. Um, and if you're familiar with ST, uh, you should get some ST vibes. So uh, here we've got new register. A new register basically says, if we have a function that when given a register, uh, can do some parsing with it. Um, and there's this for all R, which means the register can't leak. So if we tried to return the register here and be cheeky, it would all fall over and the compiler would scream at us. Um, then essentially we can sort of put this parse array's result in the register and use it in this function as much as we like. And we can interact with it with get. So given a specific register, we can get the result out and put, which um, doesn't quite look like the state monads put, right? Because instead of just an A, we have a parse array. And that's because usually when you when you use put, uh, what you usually find is you you bind and you get a result out and then you put that result. Uh, and obviously we don't have binds. So we need a way of, of navigating that, that landmine. And the answer is just embed it in a parser. Um, so as an example, here's modify, where we put into some register the result of P applied to, which is the function that we want to modify the register with, applied to getting the register. Um, and so it's slightly different form to what you might be used to. Usually we'd say, you know, uh, put of uh, F, F mapped on to get. And here we've just got this sort of extra level of indirection because there's these passes here, but it stops us from needing bind, which means everything works. So those are the basics. Um, and again, this is, this is sort of scope safe. If you try and be cheeky and rip your registers out the hole, everything explodes. Haskell does not let this type check. So just like ST, all safe, all sound. Um, and we can make as many of these registers as we like. They'll all have unique names. So earlier on, we said that you know, selectives can't implement join and they can't persist results. Well, registers can persist results. Um, 
hopefully that's obvious enough, right? You have a piece of state, so it can store values. Um, and together, selectives and registers can implement join. And we'll focus on the persisting first. So his bind, our old, our old enemy. Um, and what we said was it takes a result A and it generates more structure and then goes and um, pops a, a new parser out. So this is um, something I didn't mention earlier, which is S bind. And this is the bind that comes from selectives. And you can see by its constraints gives sort of an indication of how it works. Essentially, uh, if the type you're working with is finite and enumerable, you can use those actives to just simply check every single thing in order until you're done. Now, that sounds great until you, know, you try it, as I have done before, uh, on a humble character, and suddenly you've, you've dealt yourself a 65,000 way branch statement, GHC falls over and dies, um, and you pick up the broken pieces of your RAM. Um, so in practice, SBind is not practical. If, if you've got very small types, it's great. Otherwise, uh, it's a huge no-no. And it's, it's a reason why selectives can't implement join because it can't enumerate parsers. Um, there are an infinite number of parsers, we can't enumerate them all. Um, or at least there's not, it's not bounded. We could you know, encode a way of stepping through every parser ever, but th there isn't an end to it. Um, and this is, this is the new bind. This is the register bind. And it's got a slightly different shape again. This time, instead of an A, we have a parser A. So we have some static program that goes in and static program that comes out. Um, and here's how it's implemented. So essentially, we run the parser P, here it is, and um, we shove that into a new register, which we'll call reg, and then we call this F with get reg. So um, if, you, if you never edit this, which of course you can't because I've never exposed the register to you, this is the same value that came out of P, and you can just use it over and over and over again. The key is though, I can allocate the registers at compile time. They, they're not runtime dependent. Um, and you're always having to rely on this structure here. So you can't sort of inspect the A um, with if, if statements and stuff like that. You're, you're restricted to using it in the parser form. So if we, if we look at something that used bind before, um, so we, we have a P here, an X comes out, and we're doing something like fmap f on pure X, apt onto Q, apt onto pure X. So we're using the same value twice. That's something that we've, we lost before. Uh, if we use registers, it's mostly the same, except pure X becomes X. So essentially this replaces, whenever you see a bunch of pure X's, you can just get X's and everything else works basically the same way. So that's the, the sort of persistence problem dealt with. Um, and, uh, you know, we said, what about recursion with arguments? Well, uh, you can just use a register, magical. So here's like uh, uh, an implementation of repeat in Parsec, right? This does, um, so it, it, will, it will go down n times and, um, you know, it will, it will do p over and over and over again and collect the results. Now, this does work in Parsec, um, but the longer n gets, the more code gets generated. So this will generate more and more and more and more until it reaches the base case. Um, which you might be okay with, right? If it's ref if it's repeat three or repeat four, that's okay. That's a manageable amount of code. If it's like repeat a thousand, you've just generated a colossally big program um, when otherwise we want it to be quite tight. And the solution doesn't look so pretty at the moment, um, but the answer is to take this N that we recurse on and pop it in a register. So now we can use predicates instead of if statements. So this is basically uh, a handy combinator for selectives. Uh, it evaluates um, a thing here, that's get reg, and it applies a function to it. If it returns true, it does the first one. If it returns false, it does the second one. So this is like an if statement. And so they, they sort of mirror each other. So we've got if equals zero n is the same as predicate equals zero on get reg. And pure empty list is pure of code empty list. That's what we expect by default. And here, instead of sort of saying P on the front of go, um, we actually need to modify the register first by subtracting one, that's this N minus one here. And then we can do P, add it onto the front of go as we did before. And this works fine. So um, instead of loop unrolling, essentially this one would, this one does generate a loop where N is stored in a variable and is updated every single time around. And this does not look pretty. 
Um, you know, this is a very extreme example, but it doesn't look particularly nice. Um, they can be nice if you have the right combinators. And um, this is my favorite register-based combinator. And it's the good old classic C style for loop. So we start out with a um, value we want to initialize with, that's the A. Uh, we have a step. So while, a, uh, while this function returns true, we want to keep iterating. We have a way of moving to the next step. Um, and then we have a body that we want to do, which is pass a unit. And uh, yeah, like I said, this is exactly like a C style for loop. And we can see it in action here, right? So we start off uh, you know, for i equals n, um, i is not zero, i minus minus do p. Um, and so that is really just doing, repeating n times with a for loop um, p over and over again. I think that's actually just quite nice. And obviously there's an abstraction here where uh, we can instead say, well, actually we take in a pass a b and a list of, of b's comes out. Um, and it's uh, essentially the definition of the for is exactly what we saw with the repeat from before. It's implemented the exact same way. Um, but I think this is actually really neat. And something it's useful for is actually capturing, um, you know, these classic context sensitive grammars like uh, A to the N, B to the N, C to the N. You can use a couple of for combinators to implement that, that sort of logic. We say, you know, read a bunch of A's, then for I up to N, read B's, for I up to N, read C's. And you know the last problem is implementing join, which um, they can do, and it's it's not something I'm going to show because it's horrible. But essentially, you can implement uh, an interpreter for parsers that uh, the state stored in registers and the branches of the interpreter are done by selectives. Um, and essentially, the way I can sort of tell you that this works is because I've implemented a Turing complete language using selectives and registers. And um, you know, I, I took the representation of the, the program, passed that with the first half of the parser, and then interpreted that using selectives and registers uh, to actually show it can implement, it is Turing powerful, it can implement everything. It's just implementing stuff like join is just not feasibly, well, it's just not practical um, for anyone who's, who's remotely sane. Um, but they can do everything, so that's nice. So what's next for me? That's basically where I want to start, uh, end on, not start on. Um, so I want to eliminate registers at compile time. There's, there's a lot of, of uh, pathways where registers are sort of redundant. Um, and you can, you, know, you can think about translating it back to do notation with ST on the other end. And again, error messages. I want to use this whole metaprogramming principle uh, to sort of generate error messages at compile time and insert them in the holes. So instead of having a, a memory leak, uh, or a space leak like Megaparsec has, for instance, where it's building up error messages constantly, sometimes they get thrown away. Um, we can actually just build them at compile time, pop them in the right holes, um, and basically get them for free. So that's that's sort of what I'm working on at the moment. Uh, and so that is that is 100% it. Um, and I'll just ask again, once more, does anyone have any questions? Um, and pop my GitHub link up while I do that. Thank you, Jamie. You've kind of blown my mind with the registers. I was looking at some of it like predicate thinking, is he just writing his own little programming language here? And the answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, um, might as well be. So you're, you're sort of, you're sort of just specifying like the, 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 the corner cases that you want to take advantage of in a way. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, not followed by is one of these like weird examples where registers and selectives uh, can sort of deal with it instead of join. Um, so the many most people don't know that the the the, the not followed by in parsec is broken, um, and the fix is to use join. And you basically what you do is you inside the not followed by you return either um, a pure or an empty. You return that syntax and you incorporate it afterwards. And you can do it with the selectives and the registers. You basically set the register to one of true or false in the inside the combinator um, and then outside the selector says well if the register had true in it i return unit otherwise i fail so you can implement that logic quite quite nicely it's basically just you know you whip out your imperative variable and an if statement and suddenly now with recursion on top you've got everything you'll ever need um, and it's really cool and for context sensitive grammars registers are, are really important because that's what bind was used for um, 
but you know there's no there's no power lost once you've got the registers in place okay so i'll invite anybody else to uh type a question into chat in the meantime uh you in your first slide or one of the earlier slides you had some um some strengths and advantages of parsley as opposed to other libraries against other libraries yeah. if you just maybe could review those quickly i know there was a bit about error messages in particular <laughs> yeah, so error messages they're not there yet. yeah 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 okay yeah. it's okay but they're in other words they're coming there's not like a reason that they're not there yeah there's not a reason they're there i i could implement them this week if i wanted to um you know i could implement the same error message strategy that parsec has push as much of it as i can up to compile time and call it a day and i think that wouldn't do it justice um, I'd like to sort of explore a bit more about what the choices are. Can you implement stuff like error recovery um, and things you're kind of missing from parser generators? Um, ideally, you know, we can put more work in at compile time to make error messages better, um, especially as we can sort of examine more of the, stru of the structure of the whole parser. You know, the, the question is, can you make better error messages um, if you do it at compile time? So again, this is all stuff I want to cover. But I don't just want to implement parsex error messages, um, get a bit of performance improvement from putting it with compile time, and then just stop. I think that would just be a wasted opportunity, essentially. Um, but yeah, other than that, you know, the, the performance really comes from the staging. So again, you you look at the core, you see this hand. It almost looks handwritten, um, and it's very very fast. So it's something I didn't talk about here was the benchmarks. Um, it. it in the benchmarks I've ran with it, it's been able to beat happy. Um, I did run a, a comparison against Bison, and uh, it came within 30%. So 30% of a C parser is, um, as far as I'm concerned, pretty good. Um, but you know, there's there's still more things I can do. You know, the optimizing the registers, not that they well, they are they're used in some places, stuff like many um and the chains they can all be implemented more efficiently with registers than they can without so that there, there are some sort of improvements um that can be gained by optimizing registers for instance um but really yeah that's where i stand the, the grammar you know you might put the smiley face a bit less happy uh because you do have the code that sits in the way but roughly they're exactly the same um but yeah debugging combinators and debugging stuff that's something parsec could also implement um, but Parsi does have them. Uh, analysis are the big win. So the optimizations, the analysis, uh, they come from having this compile time structure where I can walk through the AST as much as I like. I can do stuff like termination analysis because um, with the applicative parsers, you can solve the halting problem. Selectives make it a bit more difficult to solve the halting problem. So you have to approximate. Uh, monads make it impossible. Um, and then you know you can you can factor out length checks in the code so you perform one length check and read a bunch of characters all sorts of fun stuff you can do because you have the tree that's why you know i have a nice big smiley face there um so yeah hopefully that uh, that's um wrapped up or explained why these faces are as they are um for you yeah my only follow up would be um, are you aiming in the future for this be for this to be a, a parsing library that someone who's getting started with parsing in Haskell could use uh, for me it was always mm. tricky to know where to get on board with parsing in Haskell whether parsec addo parsec mega parsec trifecta yeah i i mean at the moment um, i i think that there there should be some better guides out there um, and I want to kind of work on those a bit. Um, you know, there's a Scala version of this library that's not that's not staged yet, um, but we use it. In, uh, a lot of people use it at Imperial uh, for our compilers course, and uh, you know, I've spent the last week writing up guides on how to do things and improving the documentation and stuff. I think it's something that's a little lacking in the community. Um, I think for a newcomer. Again, Parsley, Parsley sort of mimics Parsec very well. They're very similar. Um, and one advantage is you don't have like the, the intrinsics um, that Mega Parsec has. They have these specific performance combinators um, that you have to know when to use and know how to use. Parsley doesn't have that because of its optimizations. Um, but you know, there's an argument to be said that Parsley is not the ideal beginner's language because it's got that template Haskell thing on top 
that sort of distracts you from the underlying story. Um, I would say, you know, the best language to get started is Parsec and then graduate into Parsley um, for your real work. Um, but I think, you know, I imagine that there's enough plugins that you could write uh, that you could eliminate all of the, the nastiness of template Haskell and just make it completely normal looking. Um, I don't see an issue with that. I think it's just work that hasn't been done. That would be parsnip. Yeah, parsnip. That'd be great. Oh, wow. So many vegetable and herb related puns. Yeah. Um, this is like um, too tempting for me. So we, we have a few other questions in the chat now, actually relevant to the, uh, the discussion. Daniel has a nice question. Daniel, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Ooh. Okay, Dan Daniel's having some audio trouble. So uh, I'll ask your question for you, Daniel, and if your audio situation improves, feel free to jump in. Daniel says, very nice. Seems like a bit more work, but better performance. In what cases would you still use Parsec or Megaparsec, et cetera? How does the performance compare to Addo Parsec? Um, so the last time I checked, and you know, before I make any wild, wild claims, I should check the paper. Um, just to you know, remind myself on what the actual benchmarks are. Uh, so uh, the last time I checked, Atto Parsec, Atto Parsec and Megaparsec are quite similar in their performance um, these days. I think Megaparsec has made a lot of big strides uh, to be a lot more performant. So I think out of the two, I'd probably use Megaparsec. It's a bit richer. Um, but if you sort of look at comparisons of, say, JavaScript, if you're parsing JavaScript, um, Parsley uh, that you see here can be anywhere from um, four to six times faster than Megaparsec. Um, like it is, it's much more in line with Happy. So, you know, Happy in comparison for this parser was uh, around 1.5 times slower than, parser, uh, from, than Parsley. Um, so th there is definitely something to be gained by using Parsley. Um, where wouldn't I use it? Um, so I wouldn't use it if I wanted to do something really context sensitive. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I had to use join and I had to use other things and I didn't want to have to fiddle around with registers. Um, but, you know, once you get the hang of them, I think they're not too bad to use. Um, I like using registers for stuff like indentation sensitivity. Registers are a perfect application of that. Um, but for some of the more tricky things that in, involve join, I'd, I'd avoid it. Um, but really, most practical parsing is is context free, right? So um, it doesn't really impact you much. Um, most of the practical parsers I've written have absolutely zero registers and zero binds. Um, the occasional selective for stuff like filter, right? Because you, you sometimes do want to do some context sensitive lexing, is what I call it, where you know you check identifiers aren't keywords. Um, but other than that, it's quite rare. Um, indentation sensitive parsing is one example where it, it is context sensitive, depending on how you do it. Um, but again, registers really abstract that quite nicely. So personally, uh, the point I am in my life where I've embraced applicatives uh, to the point of no return, I probably wouldn't not use Parsley. Um, the only reason I wouldn't at the moment is because, uh, you know, it's it's not as stable with the with the plugins and everything. And there's a bit of overhead to sort of patch up there because you do have to depend on my versions of the plugins which aren't published. Um, and I haven't got Parsley on, on Hackage yet, but I'm, I'm in the process of working on that. Um, and actually another very, very, very good reason is uh, at the moment, uh, Parsley only works on GHC 8.6.5. Um, and it will take a little work before I can migrate it up to GHC 8.10 and beyond. Um, so that is another reason not to use it. Um, but that, you know, that will come with time. Um, it's just a bit of work to get it there. So hopefully that, that sort of answers, answers that question. Daniel, do you have any follow-up questions?
I'm guessing not, but if so, please put them into the chat. Nope, no follow-up questions. Okay, then Leon has a question. Leon, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Okay, yeah, I just wondered, so I saw the Scala version and I wondered um, if there's anything else to consider in like using it in a practical context. Uh, so at the moment, the Scala version isn't staged. So uh, the Scala version has bind in it. Um, it's based off, a, it's sort of, the, it's the precursor work. Um, it is, uh, it is, you know, just as usable as you might expect it to be because there isn't any template or, or Dottie's equivalent of, of template metaprogramming or metaprogramming rather. Um, so it, it's a very different beast, but it's still quite fast. Um, my plan is to migrate this work in Haskell back to Scala 3 um, and use the new metaprogramming framework. And I, the, the sense I get from that is actually that that's a little easier to use than template Haskell is. Um, so I think compared to the usability of Parsley in the wild in Haskell, I think it's actually gonna be a bit easier in Scala. Um, but you know, that's, that's gonna take some time before that's you know, probably working. I did make a prototype at one point, um, but that was so far ago in Dottie that it will most certainly be completely broken by now. Um, so yeah, eventually I do plan on, on getting it there. Um, and um, at the moment, I don't think there are any other parsers um, in Scala 3 that have macro support. So this will be um, a very fast contender, at least until other people implement more of them. Um, but certainly in, pass, uh, in Scala, I always use Scala Parsley, but that's because it, it is very fast and similar to the Haskell interface. Um, which is something you don't normally get with the ports. The, the Haskell ports tend to be lower performance. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Eventually, the staged version will, will appear. Yeah, great, thanks. I don't see any other questions in the chat right now. Um, out of curiosity though, uh, this is part of your PhD work? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay, did, um, do you want to say a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so um, my, my master's thesis started off with the, with the Scala work and then PhD began. Um, I had a whole term worth of teaching, then my supervisor went on paternity leave and um, <laughs> scared with the, with, the, with the need to start researching but knowing nothing, um, I turned back to Parsley and um, since then, uh, it's been evolving. And uh, this year I had the ICFP paper about Parsley, um, which is all of this work, but you know how it works under the hood, that's, that's stage selected past combinators. And uh, moving forward, things I want to do are uh, write the paper about the patterns and flesh out that a bit more, write the paper about the registers, flesh that out a bit more, um, do the paper about error messages and flesh that out a bit more and sort of start to tie up that story. Um, and so that's really where I am at the moment um, in terms of my work. And uh, we'll see how far I get by the end of my PhD. Um, but I don't think I'm going to be stopping until I've tackled all of the major things I want to do with Parsley, um, even after that. Is there something that attracted you to this topic? Um, yeah, so I, when I was a young undergrad, we did our compilers course, I had to use Antler. Um, to do the past generation. And um, I, I really didn't get along well with it. Uh, and I really disliked parsers. And um, my supervisor, I was in my second year, my supervisor showed me parser combinators during an internship. And I was like, oh, wow, no, this is, this is really cool. Um, and it was sort of that, that was sort of the turning point that convinced me to be a functional programmer. Um, before, you know, I, I liked my Java streams and I, I did all sorts of stuff, but I didn't really get along well with Haskell. Um, and that was like the tipping point where it was like, okay, I'm not going back. Um, and that's when I learned Scala. That's then later on, I, I, I wanted a, a fast pass accommodator library. And uh, I wanted one that looked like Haskell and looked like what I was familiar with. So that's what eventually spawned off my master's thesis. Um, so really, you know, the, the last, few years of functional programming that I've had have really been down to parser combinators. And I've always thought, you know, these could be better. These could be as fast as everything else. Um, 
and at least at the point I'm at now, I think you know, that's a valid claim. Um, when when Parsley is able to compete with parser generators, uh, at least reasonably or most of the time, I think that's uh, that's a sign that you know we're on the right track with um, with making parser combinators really really widespread for for practical applications. I had a hard time attempting to explain to a colleague today what parser combinators are. I mean, a colleague who is a professional software developer, and I, I try to relate them somehow to regular expressions or, I don't know, like any other functional program, little, little programs that do very simple things that you stitch together in order to produce uh, some output. Um, I don't know what's a good way of explaining what parser combinators are to people who've never heard of them, but do have some kind of programming background since uh, you, like many people, came from somewhere else before you discovered FP. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, in my, in my sort of background, uh, I would really, I wouldn't have much, I, sometimes you can think of them as really just being the functions, if you're writing a handwritten parser, the functions that you wish you wrote, um, to make it easier on yourself. That's really what a parser combinator library is morally. Um, but the way I like to contrast them with the generators, when someone asks me, well, what's the difference? Um, the real key difference about parsers, uh, parser combinators versus a parser generator, um, the really, really important distinction is that parsers are first class values. Um, so when you've got your parser generator, right, you write your grammar, uh, you compile it, you have a parser out, hopefully it gives you what you wanted. Um, otherwise you have to translate the tree into something else. And um, you know, if you, if, you, if you find yourself repeating yourself, that's all you can do is just repeat yourself. Um, sometimes the, the library might have some extra, extra goodies like uh, a precedence parser, and you can use those. Um, and you, you, know, you can use Alexa, but if it doesn't have what you want, you're kind of stuck. And, and what I'd like to think about past combinators is that now suddenly we can program the grammars and we can build the grammars in the way we want by abstracting reusable functions, reusable grammar builders. Um, you know, like if you want a precedence parser, you can write a function that does that um, yourself. I mean, a lot of libraries include them. Parsley is not uh, an exception to that, but you can write it yourself. And that's what I think is the, is the beautiful thing, is that um, you, know, you, you can build parsers using the functions that you're familiar with in your high level language. And you don't have to think it's such a low level. It's a bit more low level, but it's not so much more low level. And that's kind of, I guess, um, that's how I explain the difference. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I think they're quite logical once you get into them. But backtracking to an explanation that someone from the outside can understand can be uh, difficult. Yeah, I think it's sort of a case where you have to be uh, you have to remind them about things that they're usually frustrated by when using grammar generators. And you then show them that parser combinators fix those problems. Um, I, I don't know too many people who are out using like Yak and Bison and things like that anyway. Uh, I mean, I so I, obviously I had to write them for the benchmarks. Uh, first time I touched them since my undergrad. And uh, for a you know, library called Happy, it didn't have to be miserable. Um, <laughs> And it, it was, it's just, you know, and Bison was, was really hard to use, I found. Um, but it sort of was a nice sobering reminder of, you know, I live in this quite nice world where I have combinators and I forget that there are other things out there. Um, but at, at the end of the day, there are people that, that will say that parser combinators are too difficult to use. They don't really offer much. And they're much happier using grammar generators. It's it sort of, um, it just depends on the person, I think. Well, I think if the documentation situation can be improved, maybe fewer people will say that. I mean, I think some of these libraries are yeah, hard absolutely. hard to understand. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. Um, I mean, yeah, this year I've taken big steps with this with the Scala Parsi documentation because uh, while people you know, last year were using it at Imperial and they, they a lot of them said they really enjoyed it. Um, there's one, one of my favorite quotes about it is from one student who said, uh, Parsi combinators uh, they look complicated until you start using them and, and you find that they're actually quite straightforward. And parser generators look straight for, straightforward, but when you start using them, you realize they're just painful and really hard to use. 
Um, and I think it's that of, you have to get over that initial hump of like the learning curve. You know, you have to understand the combinators. Once you've jumped that hurdle, you're in really good territory to just do whatever you want and quite quickly as well. Oh, this yeah. is like this is like a lot of things in Haskell or, or FP generally. You just have yeah. to understand the abstraction. And the, I mean, they're, none of them are complicated, but it's kind of hard sometimes to just it's hard hold, to make that jump. Yeah. like to hold the idea in your mind. Yeah. You could looking at the selective, you can sort of see immediately, oh, this is what it's doing. But you have to at least have some exposure to this way of thinking first. And it's much easier to think in an imperative style and do it the hard way. Because at least you can kind of like, I don't know, see like the instructions in front of you. You don't have to have the concept. Yeah, yeah. I, and I mean, I agree. I think it's half of it is a documentation battle um, and half of it is an exposure battle. Are you, um, is this like an open source project? Do you take contributions if um, anyone's interested in doing that? I have accepted a couple of PRs. Um, I mean, people are free to contribute. Um, it's just to a degree of how much you can. I mean, the, Implementing more combinators, that's always easy. Uh, everyone can do that. But you know, when you start digging around deep in the internals, uh, that's a scary place. Um, but it's not impossible. You know, Someone wrote it once, that's me. So it's gotta be possible, right? Um, but yeah, I, I think if, if people wanted to give PRs, I'm, I'm happy to accept them. Um, but I would be surprised if anyone went truly deeply into it, unless they were an expert in you know, staging or something like that. The par parsing library internals are famously terrifying, right? Ah, uh, this is this is more terrifying than those. <laughs> even even more than trifecta. Uh, well, okay, I haven't seen trifectas. In fairness, um, but compared to something like Parsec, um, you know, you've got layers of ASTs and uh, free monads and code generation and staging and meta programming, and it's all there. Um, you know, levity polymorphism. You you name the extension, you could probably find it somewhere in the code base. So. Um, it's a, it's an interesting um, mix up. Okay, well, maybe um, you prefer to have users rather than contributors. So I hope you get a lot of users. I'd love both. I'd love both. But yeah, before I get users, got to be on Hackage. So that's my, my next priority, um, other than researching, is getting it on Hackage and getting it ready. Okay, well, thank you for the, the talk tonight and the great discussion. Thanks to the audience for the questions. Um, Really interesting topic, really interesting work. Uh, yeah. best, of, best of luck with it and best of luck in uh, pandemic London. Thanks. All right, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. See you next time. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Jamie. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.